Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabriel Alejandro Ope. I'm a biology teacher at NTIC Abuja, Nigeria. Now, I am going to teach you how to solve JAM questions. This time, we are going to start with JAM 2020. Question number one. The question says, the hypha of rhizopods is said to be non-septate because it... Now, the emphasis is on the word non-septate. What does it mean to be non-septate? Non-septate is talking about the fungi that does not have the cross wall. If you see these two pictures here, you will observe that in this diagram, you see the cross wall here. This is a cross wall, and this is another cross wall. So, any fungi with this cross wall is said to be septate. But if you look at this other diagram here, diagram B, the non-septate hypha, you will see that the cross wall is not here. So, based on this, the hypha of rhizopods is said to be non-septate because it has no cross wall. And the correct answer is B. Now, let us go to the next question. The smallest living organism which share the characteristics of both living and non-living matter are? Now, if you look at the options that are here, all these here are living things. But it's talking about the one that shares both living and non-living. There's an organism here in the option that has this character, and that is the virus. So viruses are organisms that are living and non-living. They are living when they find their ways into a living tissue, but outside the living tissue, they become non-living. So we move on to the next question. The question says, vaccination is carried out in order to, the word here, vaccination, what does vaccination mean? Vaccination is a product that is introduced into the body in order to improve the body immune system and to help it to fight against some disease causing organism. So vaccination is carried out in order, the correct options here is D, to stimulate the production of antibodies. This is the correct answer. To stimulate the production of antibodies so that it can fight the disease causing organisms in the body. So we move to the next question. A group of organisms of different species living in a particular area is described as a... Now, you are, you are going to look at the word different species. When you have a species of fish or a species of dog together, it's no longer a population. We call it community. So population has organisms of the same species. But here is talking about two or more species together living in a particular area. So the correct answer here is community. And the correct answer is B. So we go on to the next question. The biological association that contributes directly to succession in a community is now, you look at the word succession. Succession is a gradual replacement of species, which begins with the least organisms of plants that are found in a region, 
until a climax community is established. Now, it is a step-by-step -step gradual process. One of the basic things or factors that can bring about succession is competition. So the correct answer here is A. Okay, so organizations will have to compete for the limited resources. Now, the ones that are better adapted will uh, succeed, while the ones that are less adapted to the environment will die away. So that leads to succession. Now we move to the next question. It says you should use the table below to answer the question. Now, you have to observe the table. You have ecological zone here, temperature in degree Celsius, rainfall in millimeters. So, ecological zone one has temperature of 45, rainfall 300. Ecological zone two, temperature 32, rainfall 2000. Ecological zone three has temperature of 30, rainfall 2200. Ecological zone four has temperature of 15, and rainfall of 800. Now, the question here, high relative humidity will be expected in zones. Now, the emphasis here is relative humidity. What is relative humidity? Relative humidity talks about the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, the amount of gaseous water that are surrounding the atmosphere. And for that to happen, we need more of water and uh, less of temperature. The temperature needs to be very low, while the um, rainfall needs to be very high for more water to be accumulated in the atmosphere. Now, one, option A says II and IV. Now, if you look at one, uh, two, and four, two says 32 of temperature, and uh, three, 30 of temperature. Now, looking at this, one, two, and three has high amount of rainfall. So, two, 32 temperature, 2,000 millimeter of rainfall, three, 30 temperature, 2,200 of rainfall. So the temperature is low and the rainfall is high. So the correct answer here is B, based on these factors here. Now we move to the next question. Okay, here, which of the zones is likely to be a desert? Now the emphasis here is on desert. Now, for a place to be a desert, you remember, it, ha it has to have a very high temperature and very low rainfall. Now, looking at this data here, ecological zone one has a very high temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. And the rainfall here is very low, 300 millimeters. So only this ecological zone suits what a desert should be like. So the correct answer here is A. So we move on to the next question. What is the term used to describe biotic and abiotic factors in the environment? Now, the pointers here are biotic and abiotic. When you talk about biotic, it's talking about the living components and the abiotic is talking about the non-living components of the what? This ecosystem. So based on these factors here, the correct answer here is C, ecosystem. This defines ecosystem. Ecosystem is made up of the biotic and the abiotic factors in the environment. Now we go to the next question. Which of the following instrument is not used in measuring abiotic factors in any habitat? Now, A says microscope, B thermometer, C hygrometer, D wind vane. Now, when you look at this 
uh, instruments here, microscope is not used to measure abiotic factors in any habitat. Thermometer is used to measure the temperature of the body. Hygrometer measures the amount of water in the atmosphere. And the wind vane measures the direction of uh, wind. So microscope is not one of the tools used in uh, measuring abiotic factors. So the correct answer here is A. So we move on to the next question. Epiphytes growing on the branches of trees provide an example of the relationship known as... Now, the pointer here, epiphytes. What are epiphytes? Epiphytes are basically plants that grow on other plants' body. Okay? So this relationship does not cause any harm to the host plant. Now, in this kind of association, the epiphytes derive benefit because as it climbs on the body of a larger plant, it is able to get to the sun, so it can reach the sun for it to be able to carry out photosynthesis. But in this process, the larger plants that the epiphyte is on is not harmed, and it is neither deriving any benefit from this association. So the best word here to describe this kind of association is known as commensalism. In commensalism, one of the organisms derives benefit while the host or the second partner is neither harm nor derive any benefit from the association. Now we move to the next question. Floating microscopic heterotrophs are mostly grouped as, now you should look at the word heterotrophs. When you talk about heterotrophs, you are referring to organisms that cannot make their food by themselves, but they depend on plants and other animals for their food. So we have microscopic heterotrophs, and the opposite of heter uh, microscopic heterotrophs, you have microscopic autotrophs. Now, if you look at the options here, the phytoplankton are microscopic autotrophs. They make the food, okay? Why the zooplankton are the microscopic heterotrophs? So the correct answer here is B. Zooplankton are like animals, okay? Microscopic animals, plankton, that do not have the ability to make their food. So they depend on phytoplankton for food. The correct answer here is B. So we move on to the next question. In an agricultural ecosystem, the biotic component consists of, so you look at the word biotic component. Now the biotic component is looking at the uh, living components, okay? the living components of the ecosystem. Remember, we mentioned somewhere the biotic and abiotic. The abiotic talks about the non-living components, while biotic looks at only the living components in the ecosystem. So in an agricultural ecosystem, option A, you have crops. Crops are made up of living things. Pests are living things. And beneficial insects are also living things. So I think this should be the best option now. The answer is A, because if you look at B, crops are living things, but temperature is abiotic, non-living component. Humidity is non-living component. Now C, pest is living component. Beneficial insects are living components, but water is non-living. D, crops are living components, water non-living, soil non-living. So only option A has the living components, crops, pests, and beneficial insects. Now let's move on to the next question. The only cast in the termite colony whose members can feed themselves are they? You have the termite cast, so you have workers, reproductive, soldiers, limbs. Now, when you look at the workers, the workers are the members of the caste that can 
make food or look for food for all other members of the cast of the termites. So they are social insects. So the correct answer here is A, the workers. Okay, so the reproductives do not uh, look for food. The soldiers do not look for food. The lynx do not look for food. Only the workers look for food for all the other members in the termite cast and for itself. We move on to the next question. The function of ribosome in cells is, now when you're talking about ribosome, for, for instance, if this were to be a cell, this is the nucleus of the cell, so you have in most diagram of the cell some dot-like substances like this. So this is what we refer to as the ribosome. So the major function of the ribosome is for protein synthesis. So the correct answer here is A. Ribosomes are the components of the cell which are used in the synthesis of protein. So we move on to the next question. The process by which a red blood cell placed in distilled water absorbs water until it bursts and releases its content into the surrounding is known as. Now, you have a cell, for example, then the surrounding of the cell based on what is stated in the question here, is made of distilled water. So this is the cell, distilled water. And now, if the cell is able to absorb water into itself, and they say the process continues until it absorbs water and bursts, that means the internal environment of the cell is hypertonic. So it's made up of hypertonic solution. Why the environment of the cell is hypotonic solution. Hypotonic solution. Now in this uh, process, the hypertonic solution is going to draw in water from its environment. So this cell will begin to this cell will begin to absorb water into itself, so it starts getting larger and it continues until when it exceeds its, elast its elastic limit, then it will burst, it will begin to burst. It will burst in this process. And that is hemolysis. That is hemolysis. The correct answer here is D. When cells absorb water into itself and then it leads to it busting as a result of too much water entering into it. Well, we'll move on to the next question. When bacteria swim from cold to warm region, this is known as what? Now, it's a behavior in bacteria. Usually, they prefer warmer uh, regions or re warmer uh, 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 water. So this is a positive response shown by bacteria to what they want. So when it swims away from cold, that means the cold environment is unfriendly to the bacteria. So as they swim towards the warm region, it's good for them. So it's something they like, so it's positive. And since they move their whole body from where they are to the other place, taxis. So it's positive thermal taxis. Correct answer here is C. So we move on to the next question. For growth to occur in organisms, the rate of how would growth occur? One of these options is telling us one thing that favors growth to occur in organisms. So, A says anabolism must exceed that of catabolism. The rate of anabolism must exceed that of catabolism. So, the answer here is A. It's correct. Now, anabolism talks about the building up of larger molecules from smaller ones. For example, uh, amino acids come together in smaller units to form larger protein units. Also, glucose are smaller units. 
that build up together to form a larger uh, uh, carbohydrate. So, the rate of anabolism must be higher than that of catabolism. Catabolism is the process of breaking down larger molecules into smaller units. So this cannot encourage growth to take place. When there's rate of breakdown in the body continuously, then there won't be uh, growth much in such an individual. But when anabolism building up is more than breaking down, then growth can take place. Now we move on to the next question. Now this is a diagram of a bone. Now this, is, this bone is taken from the vertebral column, the backbone. If you observe the picture here of the bone, you will see that the bone has a very obvious process, spine, here. Now, they say use the diagram to answer the question. The vertebra illustrated here is, the correct answer here is the thoracic. Now, what makes the thoracic? The transverse process is prominent here. So you can see the transverse process and then a very prominent neural process or neural spine. So this make up the thoracic, the bone of the thoracic vertebrae. We move on to the next question. Now we are still using this same diagram to answer this question. The neural eye is labeled. Now if you observe the diagram here, based on the part here, II, this region here, is the neural eye. So, the correct answer here is II, which is B. Option B is the correct answer. So we move on to the next question. The villus in the small intestine is significant because now the villus are some tissues that are found in the intestine, the small intestine. And the major or significant role is to ensure that the absorption of food is very, very efficient at the small intestine. So for it to function very well, it needs to have a very large surface area. So option A is the correct answer. Increases the surface area for absorption. So absorption of nutrient takes place in the small intestine. And the part of the intestine that facilitates that is the villus, plural word villi. We move on to the next question. So the next question here says, which of the following vertebrates has the most simple structured heart? Now, before we come to the options here, I want us to look at these pictures here, these diagrams here. Now, if you look at this heart here, it has only two chambers, the atrium and the ventricle. One atrium, one ventricle. If you look at this one, it has two atria or auricles and one ventricle. This is one atrium, another atrium, and then one ventricle. Then this one here has two uh, auricles and two ventricles. Now, reptiles are animals that have about three heart chambers. Fish has two heart chambers. Mammals have four heart chambers. And amphibia has three chambers of heart. Now, based on this, the one with the least number of chambers, fish, which has only two, has the most simple structured heart. So the correct answer here is B, fish. We move on to the next question. Which of the following waste products in plants is excreted through the stomata and lenticels? Now, the stomata and lenticels are excretory structures in plants that can allow gaseous substances out of their body. 
Stomata are found on the leaves, while lenticels are found on the roots and sometimes on the stems of plants. So the correct answer here is carbon dioxide because it's gaseous. So they can be excreted through the stomata and lenticels. Alkaloids, tannins, and anthocyanins are weights that are accumulated on the leaves of plants. So we'll move on to the next question. The excretory structure in the earthworm is the the correct answer here is nephridium. Earthworm, nephridium. Okay? Now, for respiration, gases can diffuse in and out of the earthworm's body through the body's surface. But when it comes to excretion, getting rid of waste substances, they have the nephridia, a network of nephridia that helps the earthworm to get rid of waste substances. So the correct answer here is C. Malpigian tubules are excretory structures found in insects. Okay, so the correct answer there is C. Next question, in which of the following vertebrates does the skin function as a respiratory surface? Now, we have one of these uh, animals here that can use the skin to get rid of waste uh, substances, to respire, sorry, to uh, respire through uh, the, the skin. It is not the rat, it is not the lizard, it is not the fish, but frog. Frog is the animal that does that. It can respire through the mouth. It can respire through the lungs. And it can respire through the skin. So we'll move on to the next question. The process of walking is under the control of the brain called cerebellum. Cerebellum is the correct answer here. So it coordinates the movement, the, the voluntary movement of parts of the body, like walking, picking up objects. We'll move on to the next question. The ability of the eyes to focus on both near and distant objects is termed. The answer here is accommodation. Now, accommodation is the ability of the eye to see distant objects, that is, objects that are placed far away from it, and at the same time, for it to adjust its lens and ciliary muscles to see objects that are near to them. So if one can do that very well without a problem, then we say it is good accommodation, okay? Now, when one cannot see far and near objects at the same time, then we say there's eye defect. So the correct answer here is D. We'll move on to the next question. The hormone which regulates the amount of glucose in the blood is called, now, the amount of glucose in the blood. It is not adrenaline, it is not oxygen, it is insulin. Insulin is the correct answer. Now, insulin are released by the eyelids of legerhands. In other words, by the pancreas, when there is too much glucose in the blood. So it will mop out the excess glucose and convert it to glycogen so that it can be stored by the liver until when the body needs it. So insulin is the correct answer here. We'll move on to the next question. Deamination occurs in there. First of all, you ask yourself, what is deamination? Deamination is the removal of an amino group from protein, okay? Now, that process takes place only mainly in the liver. So when you talk about deamination, what comes to mind is liver, all right? So that's the correct answer. Next question, in which of the following does external fertilization take place? Now, the 
Emphasis here is external fertilization. First of all, what is external fertilization? We have some an animals that we, the males will deposit the sperm inside the body of the female so it can fertilize the egg to form the zygote. Why there are other animals that the male will release the egg, they will release the sperm outside the body of the female to fertilize the egg that the female has released outside her body. Now, in these organisms that are listed here, we have one particular one that shows external fertilization. Toad is the correct answer here. So, toad exhibit external fertilization, where the female releases the egg in an aquatic environment, and about the same time, the male releases the sperms, which randomly fertilize the eggs in the water environment. So we call that external fertilization. But lizard, bird, and cockroach exhibit internal fertilization, where the male releases the sperm inside the body of the female to fertilize the egg in order to form the zygote. We move on to the next question. The bright colors of the comb and feathers in peacock are four. Now, if you look at this picture here, this is beautiful color here of the comb, and the feathers are well colored. Now, this can only be to attract the, uh, the opposite sex when there is time, when it is time for reproduction. So, the male picker displaces its color to attract the female. So we call that behavior courtship. So correct answer here is C. When the male begins to display it, what it has, its beautiful colors before the female to attract her, courtship. Next question. The butterfly is of great economic importance because why is the butterfly useful to uh, the, farm, the farmer or to plants? A, because of its use in scientific studies. No, it sucks nectar from the flowers. That is not economic importance. C, it adds to the beauty of the environment. No, it pollinates flowers of crops and other plants. Yes, this is the answer. The correct answer here is D. Now, when the butterfly goes to feed on the nectar of the flower, that sugary juice, it goes there to feed, but in that process, it pollinates the flower. To pollinate means to deposit pollen grains on the stigma of the flower, which is very useful to induce reproduction in plants. So the correct answer is D. Next question. The probability of a baby being a boy or a girl depends on the contribution of? Now, when it comes to sex determination, the man can have on the X or the Y chromosome, but the woman will always have the X, X chromosome. Now, Y chromosome will make a boy, child, and X chromosome will make a girl, child. Now, if the man is the one who has the Y chromosome, that would make a boy, child. Because for a boy, child, the man will, for example, for, for, uh, for a girl, child, when the man, let's say, he, in the process of meiosis, produces the X chromosome, and the woman also has the X chromosome, then this would be a girl. So this would be a girl child. But if the man brings the Y chromosome, and the woman brings either of this X chromosome, okay, excuse me,
Okay, this will give you x, y. So this will be a boy. This will be a boy. So the probability of a boy being a, of a baby being a boy or a girl depends on the contribution of the father's sex cell. The father's sex cell. Because as you can see, only the father can make the Y chromosome. The mother does not have the Y chromosome. She has just the two X chromosomes. So she has no business making a poor child. So mother's sex cell, no. It's the father's sex cell. So this is the correct answer. So we move on to the next question. Both recessive and dominant characters are found where do you find them? A, on different chromosomes in the cell. No, at the same locus. Recessive and dominant characters can be found at the same locus of a homologous chromosome. This is the correct answer. This is the correct answer. So when you have a homolog or a homologous chromosome that has the location of both the recessive and dominant characters. So we say that is the answer. So we look at the next question. In the population of living things, the parameters of size, the parameters of size, height, weight, and colors are examples of, now when you look at this, they are continuous, okay? Continuous variation. Continuous variation in the sense that they are characters that can change with time, okay? They change over time. The weight, height are things that are observable that change with time. So we move on to the next question. Paternity disputes can most accurately be resolved through the use of... Now, the easiest way to resolve this issue is by carrying out the DNA analysis. So when you carry out the DNA analysis, it looks at the segments of the genetic material that makes up the child in comparison to the father in context. And that will determine who, which, which of them has the presentation that is closest to the baby. All right? So this can be carried out by the DNA analysis. Next question. Which of the following is the best explanation for a child who is phenotypically short and born of tall parents? Now, the child is said to be phenotypically short, even though the parents, the two parents are what? Tall. Now, that the parents are tall does not mean that the children must all be tall. Because a tall father, a tall father can have in him either the sets of characters or this or this. And the same applies to the woman. She might have this in her gamut or this or this. So even though the both parents are tall, the gamut might be of this set of characters or traits. Now during the process of making the child, if in the sperm cell of the man, it carries this recessive trait to make a short child, and then from the woman, she also contributes this recessive trait to make a short child. Now since the child has inherited two copies of this recessive trait to make a short child, then there's no magic that can be done. The child will be short. So this is why it happens in that manner. So now we look at the options here. It says both parents possess genes for shortness. So the father possesses a gene for shortness. Nature makes no, the child is no. The correct answer here is A. So if the both parents have the recessive trait in their gametes, then this from the father, this from the mother, so the child will be short. But assuming the man 
uh, let's say the man brings the short trait and the mother brings the tall trait. Then this is a dominant character that will max this recessive character. So the child will be tall. So this we say is heterozygous tall. But if both of them make this contribution, then the child will also be tall. And this we say is homozygous tall. So both parents will make a short child if they both have the trait in them to make the short child. Next question. We have to use the diagram to answer the question below. The process of water loss and intake, intake indicated by the arrows labeled one and two, arrow one and two, are respectively. Now, if you look at this here, vapor is leaving the uh, organism here through a process of evaporation. So here, water enters into the toad through a process of osmosis. So the correct answer here is A. So A is the correct answer. This is evaporation. And this is osmosis. So correct answer is A. Moving on to the next question. The noticeable adaptation of the animal to its aquatic habitat is the possession of, now if you look at the web digits here, the web feet. So this helps, the web feet, uh, digits help the toad or frog to have a balance in water and to swim in water. So is an adaptive uh, uh, character or feature that it has that helps it to stay in water. So the correct answer here is A. So we'll move on to the next question. We have to use this diagram to answer the question here. The type of protective adaptation exhibited by the animal is, now, if you look at the upper part of the animal, it is more designed or colorful why the under part of it is less colored. This is counter coloration, okay? Counter shading coloration. The correct answer here is counter shading coloration. We move on to the next question. We have to use this diagram to answer this question. The question says, the structure labeled one, this, part here is, now what is this one here? This structure labeled here is known as the whisker. This is a whisker, okay, or the vibrisse. So the vibrisse or the whisker is very sensitive to touch and that is tactile. So the correct answer here is D. So the structure labeled one which is the whisker, is tactile. It senses touch very quickly. Thank you very much. See you again in the next class.